Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you to the, to the Society. Uh, I was absolutely thrilled to bits when uh, I was awarded this medal, and it is a huge honour. Uh, I think being awarded the medal means I'm officially classed as old now. <laughs> so this, this talk is a little bit different. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a, a personal ramble through, uh, through historical things, things that I've been involved with, and as you say, particularly the people that uh, I've been involved with. And I'm going to start off with Raymond and Neil, uh, who, and um, Neil retired this year, and, uh, and so they started me off. So 33 years ago, I was like many of, of you in the audience, and I'm going to kind of aim this talk at, uh, at those of you who are early career scientists, PhD students, uh, postdocs, because I know it's hard to believe, but we were like you once. <laughs> and right back in 1984, uh, I was at the first uh, of these sorts of conferences, uh, and in 86, and in fact, uh, Ed Hill and I have a bit of friendly rivalry about who's attended the most of these conferences, and he wins, because <laughs> I was at sea in 2004, but, uh, but anyway, uh, I've always uh, been a firm believer of these conferences and I like, like the atmosphere and I hope that continues uh, in this brain. So I'm going to have a few sort of little messages to the early career scientists as I go through and my first one is join the society, participate in things and network with people. That's what science is all about. I'm echoing what um, uh, Martin Visbeck said yesterday, science is all about those people. So. These are a few of the, the people who helped me throughout my career. They were my mentors, the, the people who gave me little bits of advice, or some of the people that gave me little bits of advice, uh, and they made a difference to, to my career. They're all male, you will note. Uh, but I hope in future there'll be, uh, for you guys, there'll be a few female faces. Uh, up and, and I wanted to highlight a couple of these. Uh, the first was uh, first is David Webb, and he really uh, got the Challenger Society up and going in the late 1980s after it had fallen a little bit moribund. And I don't think that re that uh, contribution is really recognised. It's really thanks to him that the Challenger Society got got up and going again. Uh, and the other guy I wanted to mention was Des Barton, because one of the things I remember asking him when I was a postdoc was how do I know what my research interests are? Because people used to say to me, uh, what are your research interests? And I'd say, well, whatever I'm paid to do kind of thing. <laughs> so what I want to try to get across in this talk is, how do those ideas happen? Those of you who are PhD students and postdocs, a lot of it is serendipity, you're in the right place at the right time, or somebody might spark your interest. And I suppose I, I'm going to uh, try to see how, why I did the things that I I did, and it's largely thanks to Des, because what Des said to me was, it'll come, don't worry, it'll happen, and I'm saying that on to you. So I also wanted to say uh, a huge thanks to all the students, uh, the postdocs, and the collaborators that I've had over the years. That's what's made it great fun. I've got a few pictures of them as we go through the talk, but there are too many to, to recognise uh, individually, but I've, they're what's made it for me. So I'm going to talk about the Antarctic. It's my favourite area. It's the area that I've been occupied in for quite a lot of my career. And uh, I'm going to talk particularly about this uh, little current right close to Antarctica going all the way round there. And this is a bit of a spaghetti diagram. The only things that if you're not a physical oceanography, the only things you have to, to remember is that uh, in the middle of the Southern Ocean, there's the Antarctic Circumpolar Current going east, and uh, right close to Antarctica, there's the Antarctic Slope Current going the other way, and that's the current that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to talk in particular later on about two, two regions of the slope current, one here uh, in the southeastern Weddell Gyre, uh, and one here at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. So I'll jog back and forth between those two regions. So 
what is this Antarctic slope current? What is this uh, Antarctic slope front? Well, it's the boundary between what's on the Antarctic shelf and uh, the open Southern Ocean to the north. And this diagram here has got loads and loads of different processes uh, happening, which make it also interesting, the interactions with the sea ice uh, and the atmosphere. But essentially, it's these processes along the, the continental slope that I'm going to be particularly uh, talking to you about today. And this current is important because it plays a role in, in either preventing exchange between the shelf and the slope or facilitating that exchange. And as a physical oceanographer, I'm interested in heat uh, and fresh water and salt, but uh, this also plays a role in, in transferring nutrients or, or krill larvae or, or other organisms. So it's, uh, it's an important and interesting boundary. And the way you can recognise this slope current is uh, traditionally by this V shape uh, in the isopycnals, the isotherms, uh, like here. And this, was, uh, this current was uh, first discussed by Stan Jacobs back in the 1980s. And so if you look at here, uh, the, at the crosses mean the current's going into the page and you've got this current going along the uh, Antarctic slope uh, with these V shaped isopycnals. And those, uh, that slope is associated with a westward uh, slope current. So why do we care about the Antarctic? It's an awfully long way away. Uh, what I want to think about now is, uh, is the, its role in, in global, global climate, really, in global climate models. And uh, one of my students, Celine, looked at all of the most recent CMIP5 models uh, and compared... Uh, each, of the, each of those models, the bottom uh, in, the, in the historical uh, run, clock control run, uh, so she compared the temperature at the seabed. So here is the observations uh, up in the top left, and, uh, and you can see the cold over here, most of the region that I'm going to be talking about, uh, and warmer over here. And all of these models have absolutely enormous differences between uh, the model and the observation. So these changes, the red colour, uh, is, is two, one or two degrees Celsius. So these models don't get the properties of the Southern Ocean right, and that's largely because they don't get the properties on the Antarctic continental shelf right. Uh, neither do they get the processes of exporting from the continental shelf into the deep ocean right. Do we care about that? Yes, we do, uh, primarily because, well, for several reasons. Uh, and one of the most important is the impact on sea level rise. The, if, you, if you run a climate model and you put an ice shelf into it, it's crucial that the temperature of the water around the ice shelf is roughly right. And we saw that they're not roughly right. And we're very concerned in particular with these ice shelves uh, in this uh, area of Antarctica, because those are the ones that are melting and are accelerating their rate of melting. And uh, we need to be able to predict how fast those uh, ice shelves are going to continue to melt, whether they're going to continue to accelerate and thus uh, influence sea level. But uh, it's also important for climate because those water masses formed around Antarctica go on to uh, form Antarctic bottom water and go throughout the world as part of the global thermohaline circulation. They're also important for, for carbon sequestration and all of those processes around Antarctica. So it's, it's important that we get these things right. So I've said that the uh, ice shelves are beginning to uh, melt, or some of the ice shelves are beginning to melt more quickly than they used to. And in fact, that that's had a, a measurable uh, effect on the salinity of the Ross Sea, for example. So uh, here, what we've done is put together all of the historical data that we could get our whole hands on, uh, all the way around Antarctica on the continental shelf. And anywhere where it's getting uh, red is uh, a warming trend, uh, blue is a cooling trend, or uh, red is a uh, more salinifying trend, blue is freshening trend. Most of the areas around Antarctica are all hashed out. The reason for that is we just don't have the observations. We don't have enough observations around Antarctica to be able to put a statistically significant trend 
on uh, whether it's warming or cooling, freshening or getting saltier. But there are some areas where it is. So the Ross Sea, for example, is freshening, and that's believed to be due to this enhanced melt from uh, over here. If you look at the uh, schematics on the right-hand side, uh, there are more or less two types, two to three types uh, of interaction between the Antarctic shelf and the slope. And in areas like the Amundsen Sea, which are the ones that are warming uh, and, uh, and, fresh and uh, causing the enhanced melt of the ice shelves, there, this warm water from offshore can get onshore and melt the ice. The, the areas that I'm going to talk about today uh, are more like, uh, are parts of the Weddell Sea and are more like this. So in this area, there's not so much uh, warm water getting on shelf, although it does. Uh, and by and large, they're cold, they're salty, and they form uh, cold, dense outflows, which form Antarctic bottom water. It's mostly these I'm going to talk about today. So I said it was going to be a bit of a ramble, and I'm going to go back through uh, half a dozen uh, expeditions that uh, I've done over the years. And, uh, and it's sort of the story of my, my scientific life, really. Uh, and I'm going to go right back to the Woe sections in uh, 1985, and then uh, through, through the years. And each time, uh, new, uh, new technology, uh, new ways of doing things. And Rachel said that, uh, I was uh, uh, keen on new, uh, new ways of doing things, and indeed I am. I, she, she was very charitable. I would say it's because I like new toys. I like new ways of measuring things. It's great fun. So I'm going to go through these in kind of chronological order to try to tell you why we did things. So right back in the 1970s and the 1980s, when most of you weren't born, there was... Uh, Satellite remote sensing had just come out and people were thrilled to bits with being able to see eddies and fronts and jets. And that was the kind of science we were all doing at that time. Uh, and the, the sort of old water mass type stuff seemed terribly old fashioned. Uh, what we did was we uh, took all of the available data, all of the available CTD data, and we put it all together into climatologies. And in fact, I remember one very eminent physical oceanographer saying that we could calibrate the CTD against the properties of the, the uh, water in the deep water. That would be unthinkable nowadays because things began to change. We began to realise that climate change was happening. And so what oceanographers, the, the powers that be at that time, I wasn't involved, but the powers that be decided that it, what we needed was a snapshot of the ocean. Snapshot meaning uh, about five years. And, uh, and they came up with this idea of uh, the World Ocean Circulation Experiment, WOS, which was going to do a whole set of sections throughout the, uh, the global ocean. And I remember as a postdoc going to uh, a meeting where they talked about these things, and I remember people saying, well, who on earth is going to do these great long hydrographic sections? Because nobody's going to want to do that. So then I got uh, a lectureship at uh, UEA, and Raymond Pollard came up to me and he said, we're looking for somebody to run one of these WOS sections, and, uh, uh, and will you do it? So I said, Whew, OK, I'll do it. And I knew nothing about the Southern Ocean. I knew nothing about geostrophic currents. I'd done mixed layer modeling for my PhD, so it was a, it was a big step. But uh, I said yes, and, uh, and we did this uh, hydrographic section, a whole group of us, lots of collaborators. We did the WOS hydro hydrographic section from the Antarctic here uh, up, to, up to Brazil in 1995. And that, data set is still being used as, as part of the global climatology. So I think my uh, little message from that is seize opportunities, even though they seem daunting, say yes to things uh, and look ahead. Uh, if you're going to a meeting and you think something, you know, science is moving in a direction, go and learn about it and, uh, and don't be too daunted. It was 
it was a good decision for me at, at the time. So, uh, I should go back to that, really. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about, so the, the, so the section as a whole went all the way across. The bit I'm going to talk about is this bit, right close to Antarctica, where you can see those uh, isotherms sloping down uh, into the Antarctic continent. And that's the Antarctic slope current. So, back then, we didn't have fancy colour pictures. We had to do everything in black and white. We had to have somebody to draw these things for us. So, that's what these are. So, here's a little section... Uh, going from Antarctica on the left uh, out across the Antarctic continental slope. This is temperature, this is uh, the velocity, uh, this is where the section is. So it's going from the uh, edge of the ice shelf that's there uh, out into the Weddell Gyre. Uh, and a little note, uh, back then, uh, nine stations in 100 kilometres were considered to be really high resolution. Standard WOS spacing was about uh, 50 kilometres or so. So, what did we see on that uh, first section? We, this is one of the, uh, this is the uh, uh, southernmost section in WOS, uh, and we were one of the few to go onto the continental shelf and slope. And we saw these uh, sloping isotherms uh, going down, marking the, uh, the slope front. We saw some very interesting intrusions across the front. Uh, we saw them in the oxygen isotopes, which indicate how much glacial ice melt was there, uh, and in temperature. So you can see this cold water crossing the front. And uh, we were able, using the relatively newfangled at the time, shipboard ADCP, uh, we were able to uh, reference the geostrophic shear. And we measured that transport <laughs> to be about 14 sverdrups. That's 14 sverdrups flowing in the Antarctic slope current going west. So that was the, the 90s, and then uh, at, uh, a couple of years later, uh, Dave Stevens and I uh, were planning uh, a, a grant proposal, and uh, we put in <coughs> to NERC for funding for what's called uh, Albatross. I can't now remember the proper acronym, but Richard Sanders called it a long, boring, and tedious round of silly stations, <laughs> which has stayed in my mind more than the real one, uh, which indeed it was fairly long. Anyway, uh, it was part of a, a Scotia Sea survey, but the bit that I looked at and would like to tell you about was uh, a, set of section, a set of stations uh, now from the Antarctic Peninsula here going uh, along the top of the uh, South Scotia Ridge uh, east. And uh, one of the nice things about this was uh, we were doing uh, this albatross survey around about the same time as the Spanish and the US were doing some surveys in the region. So we were able to put together lots of different nations' sections uh, and map the slope current uh, as it went round the, uh, the peninsula. And so here's the uh, transport figure that we came up with. And uh, here, the slope current was round about 10 sverdrups. Uh, and the further offshore, the Weddell front was round about 10 sverdrups as well. So this, is a, 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 this was the schematic that we came up with, uh, showing the, the path of this uh, front tied to the bathymetry. Uh, looked as though it was always round about the 1,000 metre uh, isobath and we were able to, to map those, quantify the transport in some of these gaps. So this got us talking to our colleagues at Bass and thinking a little bit about what uh, are the implications of this really complicated current system for the krill larvae that, uh, that spawn, or the, the krill that spawn round about the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, and their larvae are carried by these, this current system uh, out towards South Georgia. So we were kind of intrigued by that. Uh, and we were also intrigued by this uh, coastal current with the fact that it sort of disappeared over here and we wanted to know whether there was anything that went further west. And so we came up with the idea jointly uh, with Bass of, uh, of putting together uh, a new proposal, a project, that would try to uh, understand both the physics and the biology. And we would put some drifters in 
uh, and we'd also do some, uh, some hydrographic sections. So we did uh, a section on, uh, on the ship here. And what I want to point out with you, I said earlier on that the slope current was a bit like a river, a fresh river in the uh, ocean. And that's what you can see here. So uh, this is the shipboard ADCP arrows, and it's colored by salinity. And this strong jet here between the 500 and the 1,000 meter ice bath uh, uh, is this fresh uh, Antarctic slope current going, uh, going north. And uh, because uh, we now had new tools, we had the lowered ADCP, uh, we were able to uh, map these, uh, the, the frontal structure in much more detail. So the red is going into the page, uh, the blue is coming out of the page, and uh, one of the things we saw was that each time there's one of these frontal jets going north, there's a little bit of a retroflexion uh, coming out next to it as the blue. We were also able to look at the, the dense outflow here down the bottom. So it's dense, it's cold, it's relatively fresh, and here are the cores of that uh, outflow. Very much tied in with this slope current system. So that's the, the, the Weddell Sea bottom water that eventually becomes Antarctic bottom water. And there are interesting things about the relationship between the slope of the seafloor and where those fronts are. So we're now able to see things in much more detail than we were back in uh, the mid-90s, uh, where we're getting much better picture. We've now got a few more stations across this, uh, across this flow. So the drifters were uh, a new toy for me. They were fun. And, uh, and we deployed the drifters along this section and uh, looked to see where they were. And sure enough, some of them went round to the west. Uh, unfortunately, they all died round about here, so we couldn't see how much further they, they went. Uh, but we were also able to see the drifters going up here in the slope current uh, and going round here in the Weddell front and all these complicated interactions uh, up to the north. And so one of the things that the drifters told us that we hadn't been able to learn from the, the just the uh, putting together of the historical hydrographic sections before was uh, the, the influence of the topography. There were standing eddies, there were flows around here, there was a flow up to the north, uh, and uh, the Weddell front, which we thought originally back in 2004, we thought uh, it would sort of split from the slope current. We, know, we now know that it's a little bit further offshore, you can see it. Uh, and we were able to uh, see with the drifters this flow into, into Bransfield Strait and round. So uh, this is important from the biological point of view, where those flows go. And interestingly, uh, in a way, we didn't need to have done that with drifters, because icebergs do that job for us. If you track all of the icebergs in, uh, in, in, uh, that have, or if you look at the tracks from the icebergs that have been tracked, uh, either by quick stat, scout or by GPS, you can see that all of those icebergs follow exactly the same path. So the icebergs are uh, moving along in the Antarctic slope current. Why does that matter? That matters because as icebergs go along, they're melting all the time, and uh, they're bringing nutrients, probably iron. So they're fertilizing the water uh, as they go along. And we'll come back to that uh, later on in the talk. So the next thing that, th that kind of uh, influenced me was uh, in the 2000s, there was a lot of discussion uh, about what we should do for the upcoming International Polar Year. So this was the 50th anniversary of the original uh, International Polar Year. It was in the late uh, 2000s. And uh, the UK community got together with uh, all, all other nations, oceanographic nations, Antarctic nations, to think what would be, what, what could we do that the total would be better than the sum of the parts? So how can we work together? So. Uh, in a group that I was involved in called Ianzone, uh, we came up with the idea for this uh, hedgehog diagram. So 
each nation, where they could, would try to occupy uh, sections and moorings all the way around Antarctica, trying to be as synoptic as possible. So within a, a couple of years, the sort of 2008 to, to 2010 time frame. And uh, I guess the message that I have uh, from that is it's international collaborations that are the lifeblood of what we do. So you boo to Brexit. <laughs> So, uh, as part of the UK contribution to SASI, we uh, had a moored array uh, back in the uh, southeastern side of the Weddell Sea here. Uh, we put a half a dozen moorings crossing the continental shelf and slope. And all the things that I've told you so far have been sort of summer snapshots. But by putting a moored array, we were beginning to get the whole, uh, the whole year. It's only one year but one year is a lot better than just a couple of summer snapshots. So using that moored array, uh, we were able to calculate the transport of the slope current through the year. And uh, what you can see is that in sort of April, May, June time, uh, it's uh, a maximum, that's the blue colours, and that the peaks in the uh, transport of the slope current more or less coincide uh, with the strong uh, negative wind stress curl. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that we did was uh, to composite up all of the times in that time series when there was uh, a low transport and when there was a high transport. So on the left, we've, whoops, sorry. On the left, we've got the high transport, on the right, the low transport. The, the background colours here are the same in both, but the circles indicate the values at the mooring during the high or low transport. So the differences between the circles and the background tells you the change. So here, uh, the, the blue tells us that when there's a high transport, that blue water, those, uh, the isotherms, are coming uh, lower down. And... Uh, when there's a low transport, the uh, isotherms as are, are coming up uh, and potentially more able to get warm water onto the continental shelf that might go to melt ice shelf. So these changes may be quite important. And in wind stress curl, uh, you can see the strong wind stress curl uh, for the case that with, with the high transport. So we're beginning now to understand how... Uh, the current may vary through the year. Now, right back in 95, uh, when we did our uh, single section, we noticed that there was this uh, undercurrent, a current going back the other way beneath the Antarctic slope current. And nobody would ever mentioned this in the literature. I remember being quite puzzled and going back and reading lots and lots of, of papers and trying to see if anybody had seen this. And in fact, uh, Eberhard Feuerbach had had some moorings further uh, round. And if you looked at his figures, you could see this undercurrent, but he hadn't mentioned it in his papers. So we talked a little bit about this uh, undercurrent uh, in this paper, but that was just a snapshot. And we kind of wondered, well, is this, is this real? So uh, one of the things that we were able to do with our uh, SASI survey was to investigate whether this uh, undercurrent was indeed real. And what we're seeing here is, uh, are the, is one of the uh, ship-based sections. And uh, the figure that I really want you to look at is this third one, the long slope current. And the blue is the flow coming out of the page. And the red is the flow going into the page, which is the uh, Antarctic slope current. And here's this undercurrent coming back out. So this, uh, this undercurrent seems to be a, a robust feature. What we don't know really is what causes it. There's suggestions it's associated with uh, wind events, trap waves. Uh, and what we don't really know at all is the influence that that undercurrent might have on transporting things like nutrients or krill larvae. So I'm going to finish up 
Uh, we're talking about gliders. Those of you who know me will know I can't possibly give a talk without enthusing about gliders because I think they're great. Uh, and really, uh, I think what gliders give us, and I'll try to show some examples of that, is first the high resolution, but also the possibility to bring together the physics, the chemistry, and the biology, because you measure all of them on one instrument. So we've heard a little bit about gliders uh, this week. They're particularly good for making measurements around Antarctica. It's a difficult place to get to around Antarctica. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, there's lots of hazards. So using a glider, you're not putting a person's life at risk, uh, and, uh, and you can make measurements in quite inaccessible places. And you can uh, have all of these multidisciplinary sensors on the same uh, instrument. And my message is, science should always be fun. Do things that appeal to you. Do things that are fun. And if they're not fun, do something different, you know. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our glider campaign. Uh, how am I doing for time? Okay, good. Um, so, I'll talk to you a little bit about our, our uh, Gentoo project, uh, which uh, went back to the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, and again was a multidisciplinary uh, study with Bass, uh, with, the, with the biological oceanographers. And I wanted to start by just demonstrating uh, how much resolution you get with a glider that you don't get with a ship. So on the right-hand side is a section, a hydrographic section, from the ship uh, across the Antarctic uh, shelf and slope, covering roughly the same distance as the uh, picture on the left, which was taken at about the same time from the glider. And these CTD stations marked by the diamonds are about 10 kilometers apart, which is high resolution for, for a sort of general physical oceanography survey. And you can just about see the front here. And if you look carefully, you can see some sort of little blue bits here. But you'd probably have thought, well, that looks a bit dubious, really. I don't, I'm not sure that's real. Uh, but in the glider data, taken at the same time, you can suddenly see things uh, in, in high definition. And you can see that little uh, uh, cold, little cold tongue here in the front. It's a real feature. It's, it's appearing in several of the, the, the glider points. And you can see things like these uh, eddies going uh, onto the shelf, which you really can barely see uh, in the ship-based data. So this is opening our eyes, really. To, uh, to what's going on on the Antarctic slope. So one of the things uh, that we were able to do was use the uh, dive average current from the glider, and that's shown here on the right. So the glider went back and forth, back and forth, across the, uh, the Antarctic slope. And uh, you can see this is colored by, by temperature. So here's the cold inshore and the warm uh, on the right-hand side. And you can see the strong uh, currents uh, going around the, the isobaths here. And you can use that uh, geostrophic, uh, use geostrophic <coughs> shear and the dive average currents to get the velocity up here. And from that, you can calculate the potential vorticity across that section. And if you're not a physical oceanographer, you can just think of that as a, as a tracer, or you can think of it as how stratified the water is. And if you uh, look at how the gradient in the potential vorticity, or the gradient in the, in the stratification, varies across the shelf, uh, that's shown here. So each one of these uh, sets of coloured dots is a different glider section. And uh, they're all done against distance from the shelf break. So 20 kilometres offshore, 20 kilometres onshore. And on the y-axis is, uh, is the PV, potential vorticity. And what you can see, oh, and this, I should say, this is averaged over a particular uh, density range, so between two isopycnals. And what you can see is all of them pretty well uh, increase uh, in PV uh, as you go onshore. And the significance of that is, uh, is indicating this onshore flux of eddies. So uh, if we look at, up at the schematic that's in this bit here, there's an onshore uh, eddy transport 
of heat, so uh, nutrients and so on, uh, counteracted by uh, the, the processes beneath uh, and on top. So it's this bit here that the glider is revealing, really for the first time. And that's important because if you're getting more heat onto the shelf, uh, that can eventually melt ice shelves or increase the melt of ice shelves. So one of the things that uh, one of my students, Marina, has been doing, and I encourage you to come to her poster this afternoon, so this is a little bit of a, a, a preview, um, is uh, she's been putting together all of those sections around the continental uh, shelf from the gliders and gridding them against the isobath because obviously the glider, sometimes it will go on a, a shallow gradient against the symmetry and sometimes a steep. So she's been able to composite up all of the sections. And what you can see here, this is the velocity. You can see that dense outflow going into the page here. You can see the peak of the uh, Antarctic slope current around about the 600 metre uh, isobath. And you can see the slope uh, in the, the, the increase in potential vorticity uh, on the uh, isotherms. So last thing I'm going to tell you about is uh, going back to the discussion of the icebergs. So I said earlier that these icebergs were carried round in the slope current, all the way round Antarctica, in fact. So when we were there with the gliders, uh, a huge iceberg went, went through our area, which had, had carved from the Ross Sea uh, years before. And it's gone all the way round Antarctica, melting as it goes. We kept well clear of it, understandably, uh, but we did have uh, measurements from the glider just after the iceberg had, had gone. And uh, what we've been able to do is look at that to see the, uh, the impact on productivity of that passage of the iceberg. So uh, what uh, Louise did here, so what, there's lots of things on this figure. Uh, the big turquoise polygons are the uh, path of the iceberg. So it was following the isobaths around here in the slope current. Uh, and th it was uh, a few days before we were there with the glider. The coloured dots are the path of the glider. And the uh, size of the symbols is uh, how much dissolved oxygen was observed. The, the maximum value of dissolved oxygen. And the bit I really want you to look at uh, are just these very large circles here. So there were a whole set of very, very high dissolved oxygen. And those, we, we have evidence to suggest that those are due to the fertilisation effect of that iceberg which had just gone through. And you really wouldn't have seen those if you'd gone with the ship because it's very localised, that meltwater is, is very localised and it has quite a uh, um, short-lived effect. And I wanted to finish, I'm nearly there, I wanted to finish uh, with just saying, uh, not just for uh, academia, but also for all of the marine industries, these sorts of new technologies are transforming the way that we're doing things. And you know, some of you in the room will go in to work in some of those, uh, those industries. And this is a quote uh, from the BP website, which I thought was rather cool. This is their figure, uh, just saying that the, these robotic technologies are transforming the way we're doing things. So not just science, but also uh, how, we, how we operate as a marine community, the whole marine community. So I uh, wanted to finish with a few uh, conclusions, summary and conclusions. So we've seen that the slope current transport is about 10 to 20 sverdrups. It's a significant transport and it plays a role uh, in taking uh, biological and chemical properties around as well as physical. There's a seasonal cycle. Having said that, we only had one year. So uh, there's lots more to learn there and uh, the maximum was in May to July. And uh, I got this, this number from the, the Bass website, so I'm hoping it's around about right, but the, the coastline of Antarctica, depending on slightly how you measure it, uh, 
is about 45,000 kilometers, which is enormous. And you think about how many measurements we've got around Antarctica, it's pitiful. So there's lots more to learn. You can still go to areas that nobody's ever measured oceanographically. So we're, we're still exploring. That current is important because uh, it has a biological impact. Uh, it carries those kr krill larvae, uh, which get to South Georgia. And one of the things that's always intrigued me, uh, and I was chatting with Eugene Murphy this morning, is how, how did those krill larvae get back? If they've got to South Georgia, there must be current systems, and perhaps it's the Weddell Gyre, uh, or, or perhaps they go all the way around, but how do they get back in order to uh, have the next generation? Maybe the biological ocean officers know that already. And those eddies... Uh, are important for transporting heat across the uh, ice. So you've got to get that current right. So all of this, uh, the models, the biogeochemical models, as well as the climate models, need to get this boundary right, if we can. And, uh, and it's really hard, because the processes are so small. They're five kilometres or so uh, for those eddies. So the message, I guess, is that uh, it's things like gliders and other new techniques uh, that will give us new opportunities for making measurements. And I think it's crucial that we do make these measurements around Antarctica. So for, for you early career scientists, I think you've got a great future. And uh, I hope that you'll be standing up here in 30 years' time telling the next generation of, of scientists what marvellous things you've discovered with the great new tools. So thank you very much. <laughs>